All right, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you all are doing well today. Uh, so today we're going to cover Chapter 5, Data and Knowledge Management. Uh, but before we do, I have a couple quick announcements. Um, so I appreciate uh, those of you who did the survey. Just kind of give me any sort of feedback, um, positive, negative, however you feel. Um, certainly suggestions for improvement are always appreciated. Uh, so I greatly appreciate you all taking the time to do that. Uh, also, you'll see in the Teams, I posted some information about the Consumer uh, Review Fairness Act. Um, so people asked some questions last class uh, about, you know, when can we actually remove reviews that are, you know, maybe we want to remove a review. How do we do that? Well, there's four categories for it. Um, you know, if, if there's any sort of confidential or private information, the re review can be removed. Uh, if it's inappropriate, uses, you know, inappropriate language, um, explicit content, stuff like that, it can be removed. If it's unrelated to the company's products or services, it can be removed. And if it's clearly false or misleading, it can be removed. So again, I'm not an expert on that or anything, but I just thought that was kind of interesting to have those kind of categories laid out. Uh, what constitutes you know, something that's clearly false or misleading? That's a little difficult to determine. And let's say that a company removes something and it's found later that it wasn't supposed to remove it, they could be subject to fines. So you probably want to tread lightly on removing reviews. Um, any questions before we jump into chapter five today? Certainly always feel free to jump in with any questions, um, but you know, just kind of talk about what we're discussing today. Uh, we'll talk about how to manage data, um, some of the different approaches we can take. Uh, specifically, we'll look at the database approach. Um, that's gonna be an approach that you'll probably run into at some point in your professional career. Uh, we'll kind of cover some of the basics of you know, why we use databases, how we use databases, um, just, just a lot of stuff with databases today. Um, we'll talk about some big data, I won't get into that too much. I will also talk about data warehouses and data marts, kind of dis discuss the distinctions there. And then we'll wrap up and discuss uh, knowledge management. So uh, let's jump right into this. So the whole concept of managing data is organizations have a tremendous amount of information. They have a tremendous amount of data. They have you know, to be able to access it quickly. They have to be able to you know, use it across different systems. They have to be able to you know, manage transactions with it, you know, making sure they get what they're owed, making sure they pay what they owe, uh, all that sort of thing plays into data. So probably the best approach that organizations have is to have some sort of data governance guidelines and policies in place to where they have clear understandings throughout the entire organization about how our data will be managed from the time in which it enters our organization until the time that it leaves our organization. And that's going to include things like how long do we maintain records for? It's also going to include things like how do we secure our databases? You know, what sorts of steps do we have in place for updating records, you know, if something changes, if something's inaccurate, how do we correct it? Uh, that's all going to be within this idea of data governance. And you know, you may have a policy; it could fill a three-inch binder, you know, where it's printed off, and it has you know each of the different components of data governance. It could be quite a large document, uh, but you know, in most part, they're going to be pretty consistent throughout organizations. They're going to have um, you know kind of designated roles for who's responsible for what aspect of the data. And that's basically all there is to say there is that it's just the organizational guidelines for uh, how we actually would manage and you know operate with our data. Uh, then we also have the idea of master data. And master data is one of those things often confused with something like big data. Um, but it's actually a little different. So master data is very structured. It has you know information that's central to our organization. Uh, depending on the definition you're using, it's typically going to include things like your customer databases, it's going to include things like your transactional databases. Um, it's going to include things like maybe your employee databases, who's working for you, what do they do. Uh, all those things are typically going to be included within master data. And you know, within that, you know, it's going to have lots of important information. But the key distinction between master data and uh, big data is that master data is typically going to be highly structured, whereas big data, by definition, it's going to be highly unstructured. Now, in practice, you may not see that distinction, but you know certainly it's good to understand that distinction. And then lastly, transactional data is, of course, data which is involving a sale or a purchase. You know, we talked about transaction processing systems. Well, the data associated with them is simply going to be the transactions. So we're going to have lots of records, and each record represents one purchase or sale within our firm. Uh, questions about that so far? Okay. Uh, so I've got two videos today. Uh, they're both kind of funny. Um, 
you're probably not going to roll out of your chair laughing if you watch them or anything, but they're kind of humorous. And they kind of uh, introduce, you know, some concepts of data management. So in this particular uh, Dilbert clip right here, uh, Wally's discussing his uh, narrow field of knowledge that he has. And he makes a claim that it's so, no uh, so narrow, you don't actually even have to have any knowledge to be, um, you know, fully knowledgeable about it. So basically what he's doing is he's kind of narrowing the definition of his field uh, to where it's so specific there's nothing included in it. Uh, I thought it's kind of funny. Uh, it kind of relates to what we've been talking about, though, where we want to have, you know, databases in place that have meaningful information in them. Uh, we don't want them to be so specific that they're tied to one specific application, they're tied to one specific, um, you know, set of things. We want this to be a database that has lots of information in it. We don't want just want it to have nothing in it. If it has nothing in it, why do we even have it at all? Uh, so that's kind of what this is uh, kind of addressing. So there's some uh, things we want to kind of to keep in mind when we're having databases, though. Uh, you know, at the basic level, we have them because we have various things happen within our company. You know, we have employees hired, we have customers that we have. Uh, information we want to reference later, we want to do that inside of a structured format. We're going to use some sort of a database to do so. And, you know, this allows us uh, several key advantages. You know, it allows us to minimize several things. We can minimize having redundant information. So we're going to talk about how we would do this, but the whole concept is, is that imagine you had an Excel spreadsheet and it had a list of, uh, you know, every single employee and where they work, you know, which office they work at. Well, you're going to have a lot of repeated information on that. With a database, you could actually have that information within separate tables and instead reference the office they work at to another table. And that allows you to save on storage space. It allows it to be processed quicker. Um, and it also is going to help in not having information repeated, such that if you have to change information, you're not having to change it in, you know, more than one place. So imagine if you're at a place like um, a large university and you have people's office locations. Well, I mean, that changes. So if you change the building name, for example, you'd have to change that in several different places. So, you know, by having that uh, thing, you just, you just remove a lot of redundancy. Uh, in addition to that, uh, databases are typically not going to be tied down to one specific application. There are exceptions to that. But for the most part, they're going to be using something that's pretty standardized and is able to be addressed by not just one application, but the majority of applications that would be addressing them at least. Uh, so, you know, typically we're going to think of that as being the structured query language, the SQL. Uh, but that's only one type of database. There are many other types of databases. But the whole concept is that they're not tied into one specific application. They're not tied into one specific department. These can be organization-wide. Uh, and, you know, kind of going along with data inconsistency, the whole concept with this is that we have consistent data uh, that goes back to governance. You know, if we have policies in place that kind of describe the nomenclature we're going to use for storing and retrieving information within our organization. So that's just some things we want to minimize. Uh, but we also want to maximize some things. You know, we have all this information. We're going to centralize that information. And through having it centralized, it's easier to ensure that proper security measures are employed upon the data. So, for example, if every employee were running a database locally on their computer, it'd be quite difficult to ensure that they had, you know, taken the proper measures to secure the database. But if we centralize that on a server and we centrally manage it, it's going to be a lot easier for us to ensure that whatever sorts of security measures we have for the data, particularly things that are going to be more advanced, like making sure that the inputs come again, are sanitized and they don't contain any sort of um, SQL statements that could be used against us. Uh, you know, it's quite easy to, if you're not using uh, data sanitation, uh, to have, you know, inputs that could come in and they could maybe delete all your data or they could download all your data. So we can avoid that by having things centrally stored and making sure that we're doing it in one place instead of in thousands of places. Uh, same thing with integrity. Um, you know, just kind of as we talked about, you know, making sure that we have uh, rules in place for having reasonable answers. Uh, for example, if I ask someone what's their student ID and they start listing me off their name, that's not a reasonable response to that question. So we could actually go ahead and set, you know, a certain format that that ID is going to be in. Maybe it's going to be numbers zero through nine. Maybe the first number is always going to be a nine. Uh, just various sorts of rules like that. And we can kind of say, until you meet those requirements, you can't input the data. Now, that's not to say that they're going to input the correct number, 
but they're more likely to input the correct number. And they're more likely to have, you know, the, the debt is more likely to be accurate if we have those sorts of measures in place. Um, you can certainly imagine a case where, you know, I could ask you for your student ID and, you know, it could be kind of confusing. Am I asking you for your net ID or am I asking you for your student ID number? Um, so if you had that measure in place, you wouldn't be able to input uh, maybe your net ID. So that's just kind of what we talk about when we talk about data integrity. Uh, and then lastly, we have data independence. And that's kind of as I talked about with the, the last approach here, where basically the data is not tied into one application. We can freely move it between applications. Uh, we can update it lots of different ways. Uh, but still, we control each way we update it from. So any questions so far? All right. So I kind of hinted at talking about the structured query language database. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more generically at this point. So a structured query language is an example of a relational database. And relational databases are quite simple. Uh, as the name implies, they're kind of formed by having relations. Uh, what we mean by relations are tables relate to other tables. So within a database, we have different tables. And depending upon the business rules and what we kind of predetermine, there's going to be certain occurrences where we can kind of reference existing information. And that's going to be very useful to us. We'll see why. But, you know, a lot of times these are going to be managed by people who maybe don't know, uh, they're not very, um, let's say, they're not very well versed in like the SQL uh, language. You know, they don't understand the queries. Maybe they don't know how to do scripting, whatever the case may be. And they may still have to input information within a database. So to do that, we can actually use a database management system. And the whole purpose of this is basically an application that allows you to easily add, remove, and you know, sorts of things like that, where you can update information without having to use you know, raw commands to do so. And that's pretty much what we would use in a lot of cases. Not every case, but uh, a good many cases. Uh, there will certainly be some cases where you wouldn't want to do that, but again, that's going to be beyond the scope of this class. So basically within this class, I'm more focused on you know, having everyone understand the basics of data management from a managerial perspective to understand you know, why we would do it, uh, what sorts of things we would do, and you know, the basics of how it's done. I'm not expecting you to be an expert in uh, data management. So I just want to kind of get that out of the way. But you know, the whole concept of you know, these tables is that on a diagram, they're going to be called an entity. So uh, they're going to be some sort of noun describing what's going to be stored within that table. So for example, if we had a student uh, table, if we had you know, something about classes, something like that, uh, we would probably have an entity for student. And it would have maybe student attributes inside of that. So attributes are going to be basically like a column with inside of a table where you have maybe things about the student, you know, the student ID number, uh, maybe the student net ID, maybe the student name, the student last name, the student um, middle initial, uh, the student's address, the student's email address, all that sorts of things we would probably have stored with inside of different attributes. So. Uh, we have entities that's going to be what we're storing. It's like the noun, and then we have attributes, which are more like adjectives for said noun. Uh, and then, you know, in addition to that, we also want to have primary keys. Primary keys allow us to uniquely identify each occurrence or instance, rather, of the entity. So that's going to be something that's going to be unique to every single record within inside of a table. So, for example, if we're talking about a student, uh, who could take a guess at what the um, primary key for a student could be? Something that's unique to every student. I'm a it could be pick. your ID number, your MSU ID number. Yeah, exactly. That's a great uh, answer there. Sorry, I dropped my pen and uh, paper earlier, and I banged my head just then picking it up. So, uh, but that's okay. Yeah, that's exactly correct. You know, it's going to be something that's going to be unique. Um, it could also be your net ID. Um, you know, ID number would probably be a more uh, you know, just an easier one to work with because you're not dealing with any sort of characters. You're only dealing with numbers. Uh, but yeah, that's exactly correct. So uh, any questions about these so far? Are these kind of clear? Did I explain them well? Okay. We got a couple more. Uh, so a foreign key is basically whenever we have a primary key, but it's not a primary key inside the entity that it's in. 
Instead, it's a primary key inside of another entity on the uh, ERD. So we have an ERD, which is basically just a diagram of you know, what our data is going to look like. So it's comprised of entities. Each entity has you know, a primary key, and then it has several attributes about it. Uh, of course, it's important to note that a uh, attribute is also, so every primary key is also an attribute. That's important to note. And you know, same with foreign keys are also attributes. So attributes are just anything that we're having collected about a particular entity. Um, and we'll do some examples of these. Um, so don't worry too much about uh, you know, anything right now. Uh, but certainly by the end of class, hopefully you'll have a pretty good understanding of this. OK. And then we also have this idea of having relationships. As I talk about, it's called entity relationship diagram. You know, we want to make sure we're diagramming the relationships between the entities. Uh, so I probably should have drawn these out. Let me see if I can draw one here. Uh, I will upload a piece of paper later. Um, I'll upload a picture of a piece of paper, rather, um, that kind of shows what these look like. But the whole concept is, is that you have some amount of minimum uh, occurrence, and then you have some amount of maximum occurrence. So for example, if I were looking at students taking a class, uh, that could be, you know, for a class, there could be one student minimum inside of a class, but there's not necessarily a maximum amount of students in a class. Not the best example, because there is a max amount of students in pretty much every class. But that would be what's known as a one-to-many relationship, where we have one instance of something happening. You know, it's the minimum, but there's no set maximum. Now, what we'd probably see is we'd probably see that as being a one to n because the n would be the maximum. So we can actually specify the specific numerical uh, maximum. So that's kind of how these are read. They're read from minimum to maximum. What's the minimum amount of uh, instances this will happen? And what's the maximum amount of instances this will happen? So again, we'll see examples that'll become a lot more clear. We can have zero to many, zero to one, where they're there's no minimum, you know, there, but there is going to be uh, a max of one. Zero to many means we could have anywhere from zero to infinite occurrences of the relationship. Uh, one and only one means there will be one and only one occurrence. Uh, we kind of see these go on. Now, the one that I have a question mark on down here is a many to many relationship. And that occurs where we have uh, one uh, thing happen it's not necessarily tied into one specific thing. So we'll see examples, but basically just know that if we have that, we have to do what's called an associative entity. And basically what we're going to do is we're just going to add in a new entity that's going to take the primary keys from each of the two existing tables and just combine them. And that reduces, uh, that actually eliminates the many-to-many -many relationship. So uh, that's something we're going to do. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at this uh, diagram right here. I think it'll be a lot uh, clearer as we kind of see this from an example standpoint. So, uh, so we have seat and we have student, course, class, section, professor, and instructor. One of uh, which one of these do you think that, that those are? So those are all nouns. What did I say were nouns on this list right here? Is it entity? Yeah, that's exactly correct. Each of these are entities. So we have a student entity. We have information about the student. We have seat entity. We have information about the seat. Uh, we have a class entity. We have information about the class, you know, the instructor, so on. Uh, and that's kind of how this is uh, laid out. So uh, that's a great answer right there. And then, you know, beyond that, we have these uh, attributes below that. So we have student ID, student name, student address. Those are all attributes. So they describe the student. And the whole idea is that this uh, asterisk right here is used to kind of denote that this is the primary key for this entity. Uh, so we have student ID right here. It describes the student. Every student has a unique student ID. Therefore, that's a unique identifier. Um, who can tell me what the uh, primary key for instructor is? It's not a trick question. Um, I mean, wouldn't that still be entity because it's technically a noun and it's like just one of the, it's the other focal point besides the students of the class? Well, so inside this instructor entity right here, Kyle, what do you think the uh, primary key is? 
Would it be the instructor number? That's exactly correct. Um, and like I said, that's going to be denoted with an asterisk. You could also denote it with a primary key symbol. Um, you could use a key. You could use uh, the initials PK. There's lots of different ways to denote it. But typically, you can kind of tell based upon the fact that that's going to be the first entity inside of, or that's going to be the first attribute, rather, inside of the entity. So whatever kind of unique symbol it has there, uh, you're going to kind of see that and kind of understand that's what that's uh, kind of referring to. Uh, now, uh, here's a good question for you all. So right here, we have a composite primary key. So this is comprised of two or more uh, different attributes. They kind of form the primary key. In other words, course name in and of itself is not unique. Um, we could have multiple courses with the same course name. Uh, then we also have course number is not unique. There could be multiple courses with the same number. But when you combine those two, you get a unique course. So for example, this class right here uh, will be Management Information Systems, uh, I think. <laughs> uh, course names, uh, I'm pretty sure that's what the course name is. Um, and, you know, there's going to be a course number associated with that. And that's probably going to be like some sort of section number uh, to where the combination of those two is unique. But if we had them separately, they would not be unique. So we can certainly have composite key. Um, does anyone see any other composite keys on this uh, ERD? What about on class? Is that a composite key? So class does have another composite key, where it's using course name and section number as the composite primary key to describe each uh, unique instance of a class. So uh, that's kind of what we uh, see here. Uh, but there's a lot more to discuss. So I don't actually, um, you know, kind of looking at this, it looks like either course name or course name, one of these two is going to be a foreign key. Um, it's hard to tell which because they don't actually say. Um, I would probably guess that it would be the one in course. It seems more logical. But let's kind of see how we would read one of these. So you always read it as saying student takes one to many courses. A course is taken by one to many students. Now that's a many to many relationship right there. Uh, so we kind of see the crow's foot. That's kind of what this is called, where we have the, the kind of thing branching off from the, uh, you know, kind of looks like a cross, but where you have basically three things going like this. Um, and that denotes the many. This uh, bar that's straight up and down denotes the one. So we have a minimum of one and a maximum of many. Now, I mentioned earlier how we would address that. We would just use an associative entity where we basically add in a new entity, probably place it about right here, kind of in the middle of those two, and just call it something like uh, maybe student registration, You know, where we have student ID uh, as for a primary key, we also would have course number and course name as primary key. So we would have three primary keys forming a composite primary key. And that would allow us to eliminate the many-to-many -many relationship. So we'll see some examples of how that works out. Um, but that's pretty much how we read these. Uh, so for instructor, we would see that instructor teaches one to many courses. But a course is taught by one and only one instructor. Uh, what about on class? How many sections of a class do we have? So if we have a class, it is one and only one section. But if we have a section, it is going to be uh, one to many classes. Uh, I don't know if that's logical, but that's how you would read that. Uh, any questions about this diagram right here? Is it going to be on the test? Uh, yes, you'll be reading these on the test, but you won't actually be making any for yourself. So I could ask you something like, um, you know, how many courses does an instructor teach? Uh, and be based on a diagram similar to this. But you won't actually have to draw anything on the test. Uh, it'll be multiple choice. You'll be given an ERD. Uh, and the reason I kind of do that is because, you know, if you're inside of a business environment, it's very possible that you'll be at some point in your career uh, looking over an ERD 
and you want to make sure that you can you know understand kind of what it's saying uh, because you may uh, be you know, in the process, you'd be on a planning committee for some new uh, system that the, your company's rolling out. Uh, so these are something that you'll probably run into. I'd be surprised if you'll ever make one yourself. Um, maybe you will, but uh, being able to read them, I think, is important. Uh, any other questions? And don't worry, we'll do some more examples of these towards the end of class. So I, I want to make sure that it's very clear to everyone, you know, how we read these and you know, what each of these different um, elements kind of mean and how they're shown. So, but we will do that at the end of class. Uh, so we'll have some other examples here. I'll do a bank customers. Uh, and then I'll probably have uh, you all kind of tell me how we would do this for employees at a job. So we'll do a start to finish inside of uh, probably use Visio. Um, you know, I just want to make sure that I get through the PowerPoint for now, though. Is that fine with everybody? Okay. Yeah, we should have plenty of time. You don't have to worry about that or anything. Um, then we had the idea of big data. So big data, like I said in the beginning of class, it's a data set that's very unstructured. There's not a lot of, um, doesn't necessarily follow traditional sorts of, um, you know, guidelines and policies for what data set would be. You know, it's going to have, uh, maybe not even be, you know, formatted at all to where it's usable. It may be, you know, comma separated. It could be um, done in a lot of different ways. Maybe it's just pure text, you know, where you have maybe, you know, different Twitter posts. It could be pure text. I mean, it's very large and unstructured. That's basically what you'd say. And within that, we want to look at three things when we're talking about big data. We want to understand how big is the data? That's the volume, you know, how much space does it take up? Um, you know, you could also do things like how many characters are inside of it, um, you know, just however you want to measure volume. I mean, there's no measurements you have to use. Uh, velocity, that's going to be how rapidly is the data set growing or shrinking. Typically, it's going to be growing. Uh, and that's going to be you know, showing at what rate do we ob obtain new data. So for a lot of times, if we're doing Twitter posts, how many tweets are we getting in an hour? Uh, how many tweets are we getting in a day? That sort of thing. Uh, that'd be kind of your velocity. How fast is the data changing? And then lastly, we want to consider the variety of the big data. Uh, how varied is the data? In other words, we're saying how Unstructured is the unstructured data. Um, it's kind of a silly way to think about it. Uh, but these are kind of the three V's of big data, where if we consider each of these things, we'll at least have a decent understanding of how the data is structured and maybe how we could approach uh, using the data. So some examples, um, you know, traditional enterprise data uh, could be considered big data. Um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily personally consider it to be big data if we're talking about purely traditional uh, enterprise data. But in some cases, it could be, particularly if we're looking at you know, highly unstructured um, data. Uh, Machine-generated sensor data, though, is probably a lot more likely to fall into this, where you have you know, just tons of data points, and you know, you're just basically given a raw data set where you have you know, possibly millions of observations, and you've got to make sense of it. Um, social media data. We've talked about you know, pulling down social media posts. Uh, not removing them, of course. I'm talking about, you know, saving a copy for, you know, further analysis, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's a great example of it. You know, you're going to have maybe uh, picture data within that. You're going to have maybe video data. Uh, and there's different types of analysis we can do to kind of, you know, analyze those and kind of see uh, what they're showing. You know, we could do basic facial recognition on it, see who's in the pictures possibly. Uh, we could do, on top of that, we could do things like look at pictures and see uh, what's the emotional sentiment. You know, we can easily do some analysis for things like that. It's going to be built into a lot of um, statistical analysis packages, particularly things like R. It's going to be quite simple to do. Um, just any other sorts of other media. We can certainly, uh, you know, consider that to be uh, examples of big data. Uh, any questions about that so far? Well, so with that, you know, there's going to be a lot of issues this introduces. Uh, particularly, we're talking about big data. You know, it's going to be very unmanageable. Um, particularly if you don't really, um, I don't want to say if someone doesn't know what they're doing, but if they're if they're not very well versed in how you would handle, you know, such a large data set that's you know pretty much devoid of structure, it, it can be very difficult to kind of gain any insight from. So that's going to be one of the major issues with it. You know, it could also come from various data sources that maybe aren't the most trustworthy. Maybe there's some issues in the um, sensors, maybe there's some issues in using maybe some sort of social media bots that kind of propagate things. Uh, whatever the case may be, the data isn't necessarily going to be accurate. 
Uh, so that kind of goes into the whole idea that it could be dirty. Uh, of course, dirty refers to the structure of the data, not anything else that uh, dirty could refer to. Um, and that's that's kind of the name of this uh, this whole thing is, you know, the whole idea of big data is that it's unstructured. And of course, if it has a lot of velocity, it's going to have rapid changing. So that kind of draws into an interesting question. You know, how does an organization, you know, analyze big data in real time? Well, I mean, the truth is, is that, you know, it's there is no such thing as real time analysis. It's you have to have uh, the data saved, even if it's only temporarily, you know, it has to be saved. So there's always going to be some amount of delay. Now, you could be talking about milliseconds of delay, not really noticeable, especially uh, from a practical standpoint. Uh, but, you know, in, in truth, I mean, there is no such thing as real-time analysis. You know, that in order to perform analysis, you have to have the, the data saved in some way. Uh, but having said that, I mean, it does have some drawbacks, but it also has some advantages, you know, some reasons you'd want to do it. Uh, so th certainly when we're talking about things like uh, doing experimentation, maybe doing things like quality control, you know, we'd want to be able to kind of easily determine based on what we've seen, you know, what we're likely to see for the outcomes. Uh, we could also do things like, you know, with social media posts. We could maybe micro-segment our customers to a larger extent than we previously could otherwise. Uh, of course, when we're talking about micro-segmentation, we're referring to basically uh, targeting people more specifically than just their basic demographic information. So uh, I used the example last class of, uh, you know, a social media advertiser is unlikely to want to, you know, sell me any sort of uh, ads for like makeup products or like mascara or something like that because I'm, I'm pretty unlikely to buy them. Um, but, you know, there, there could be some people who would be likely to buy them. And, you know, I, I, I'm not really a big purchaser of those products, of course. I'm not a purchaser at all of those products. But, uh, you know, I imagine that people have different preferences for what sorts of products they like to buy. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, you could look at a Facebook or, you know, some sort of picture, and maybe you could determine what products they're currently using from that. Um, had to be a pretty high resolution picture, I suppose. Uh, but you could probably get some of that information. And you could certainly tell the color. Uh, you could certainly tell, you know, how much, um, you know, how much sort of, um, if there's any sparkles, if there's any sort of uh, dullness, anything like that. Um, you could probably make uh, that out pretty clearly inside of a photographic analysis. So Again, you know, the whole concept is we want to better understand our customers. We want to better see what sorts of products and services they like, what sorts of products and services they don't like. And we can kind of get that information. Again, you know, we can use things like digital dossiers. We can use things like, um, you know, reading through their posts. Of course, we're not manually reading through their posts, but, you know, certainly doing some sort of textual analysis, we can get a better understanding of what our customers like. Uh, again, you know, we could also uh, use this data to kind of un better understand our current business situation. So if we're talking about, you know, what are our customers purchasing, what are they not purchasing, uh, we can have a lot of information about that. Uh, you know, there's certainly, uh, it's fairly easy to do nowadays to determine within a retail environment, you know, based on security camera footage, where do our customers go inside of a store? You know, uh, we could also, of course, use things like a wireless access point to kind of determine where people are. Um, it's not going to be as accurate as, uh, you know, some sort of image analysis, but we could certainly do those things. Uh, then we could also use it for new product development, just to kind of get a better understanding of what people like. So lots of different uses for big data, um, something that probably will be uh, increasing in the next decade and maybe you know, even further on than that. Uh, any questions so far? All right. So, you know, in addition to this, uh, I think we talked earlier on about, you know, having this sort of idea of having, um, you know, a big storage place for all the data within the organization. You know, we talked about the ERD. Well, the ERD is probably going to use something called a data warehouse. And a data warehouse is going to include, you know, things like who's working for us, who our customers are, what sort of transactions we have, how much money is inside of our different accounts. You know, what is uh, basically any question we could ask like that where it's central to the organization. It's going to go inside of a data warehouse and it's going to be highly structured and it's going to allow us to have kind of a good understanding about what information is coming in and out of our organization, at least in terms of financials and, you know, any sort of inventory, stuff like that. Uh, data warehouse is going to be similar to that, or data mart rather, it's going to be similar to that. Only instead of being for the entire organization, it's going to be for a single uh, business unit within the uh, organization. 
So maybe accounting has their own data mart for maybe accounting transactions. Um, it's not going to be applicable to the other departments, but it's just going to be for one single functional unit within inside a company. So that's the distinction there. Uh, but again, you know, I talked about these are going to be highly structured. Uh, they are going to be incredibly structured. You know, we're going to have these uh, different tables and they're going to be organized by subject. You know, so we have a transaction table. Guess what's going to be inside of it? Transactions. Uh, we have a customer table. Again, you know, you, you name it in that way to where it's going to be very clear uh, what's going to be included with inside of it. Uh, we could also use things like online analytics processing to kind of process things at a faster pace, um, kind of utilizing online resources. We don't have to do that, though. That's something we can choose to do. Uh, in many cases, that will be done with inside of a data warehouse, but it's not 100% of cases. Um, and, you know, the whole concept here is that we're not just focusing on one particular application. We're not just focusing on one particular business unit. This is going to be integrated across the environment, so across the company, rather, to where, you know, we have different uh, functional units within the organization. They're all using the same thing. We have different applications that are used by the organization. They're always in the same data warehouse. Uh, it's also going to include a time component where we can see, you know, when information was posted. Uh, that's not necessarily anything too important, um, non-volatile. Um, again, you know, it's just going to not be subject to change in a lot of cases. Um, that's not to say that it's not able to be changed, uh, but it's to say that in a lot of cases it can't be changed. Um, so, for example, if you had an application, not every single application would be able to change data. There'd be some set application that could change the data, but all the other would be read-only, um, at least for that particular part of the information. So, you know, maybe the shipping department can change it, or maybe the let's say logistics department, maybe they can change inventories, but maybe the accounting department cannot change inventories of, uh, you know, sorts of things that you have on hand. Uh, then also it's going to be multidimensional. Again, that's just saying that we have, you know, information and it's going to be able to be used by different parts of the organization. Uh, any questions about these? So this is going to be another uh, kind of humorous video I was going to show just to kind of, uh, illustrate this. So basically, um, you know, Dilbert comes in and he lays down a big stack of papers on his boss's desk there. And, you know, he says, this is the information that I have that kind of supports what I'm saying. And then he grabs a thimble and he says, this thimble fits all the information that you have to support what you're saying. And then he suggests that his boss wear that as a, um, you know, kind of as a, I don't remember exactly what he said, basically that he puts it on his head and uh, it didn't go well for Dilbert. Uh, but it's kind of a humorous little example there of uh, having knowledge management within the organization. You know, because if you look back to the 80s and before in particular, maybe even not some parts of the 90s, depending on the firm, you know, the idea of having knowledge management for the organization was to have huge, you know, multi-volume uh, reports. You're talking, you know, thousands of pages. And the issue with that is, is it really practical to read that stack of papers right there? I mean, it's, it's probably not going to be practical to read a stack of papers that, that's very long. I mean, it's, you know, people don't have a lot of time. Uh, it's boring to do. Um, there's probably a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to read a large stack of papers. So the whole concept is, is that, you know, recently, you know, firms have been kind of avoiding having that. They've been avoiding having you know, just a multitude of information kind of thrown at you. Instead, they like to kind of summarize things. They like to have things in a more accessible format that people are actually like more likely to use. So uh, that kind of plays into what we're talking about here. So just first, you know, we have intellectual capital. And that is to say that it's going to be intellectual property. So maybe it could be things that are done, uh, things that, you know, how our company does things, business processes, um, maybe different uh, products, you know, anything like that's going to be included with inside of intellectual capital. Uh, that's going to be comprised of two main components. We have explicit knowledge where we can basically write it down. You know, we could have it inside of a book. We could have it on a web page. It's very, it's basically hard facts. You know, it's not necessarily facts, but it's going to be, you know, things that can be explicitly be written down. And then that's going to kind of differ from tacit knowledge. So tacit knowledge is going to be more kind of, um, it's like a gut feeling in a lot of ways where, it's, it's harder to describe, you know, it's, it's kind of comes from experience. So basically, you know, someone's been in the same job for 30 years, they may have a pretty good understanding about what that job comprises. And they may be uh, able to kind of determine, you know, what's likely to occur based on what's occurring at the moment. 
Uh, so that's kind of what that is. I mean, explicit knowledge can be easily written down, whereas tacit knowledge can be a lot harder to kind of pass from employee to employee. And, you know, the whole concept is that we want to have a knowledge management system where we attempt to kind of document what our organization does for various things, you know, how it sort of, um, you know, how it does things. Um, you know, and this could be used internally, it could also be used externally. You know, I use the example a lot of a bank having a frequently asked questions section, you know, where you can start typing and it's, you know, tells you, hey, you know, here's what you probably are looking for. And you know, a lot of times can save you a lot of time. Uh, the same thing can be done internally, where we have different articles concerning, you know, what we do in each uh, circumstance. And it could be searchable, of course, we can use tags, make it easier to find things. So that's kind of the whole concept here. Then we had the idea of the knowledge management life cycle, where basically what this life cycle is to do is to show how organizational knowledge is created and then how it's kind of given to the organization and how we kind of maintain this. So basically we start by acquiring the knowledge. This is where we actually go out and we find something out. Um, then we apply it to something. Uh, we kind of think about it, does this fit in? Uh, maybe we create new knowledge, uh, identify any sort of gaps, make any sort of refinements that we need to. And then we actually give it out to the organization. So it's, it's kind of similar to the DMAIC process, you know, that we had earlier on, where we're going to, you know, first sort of define what we're looking for, you know, sort of figure out what the measurements are, uh, go through analyze, you know, figure out where we can make improvements, and then see, you know, reflect on it at the end, you know, do the control. So it's, it's all kind of very similar. Uh, but again, I'm not going to have this on the test where you have to tell me what's the fifth step of the knowledge life cycle. I wouldn't do that. That'd be uh, kind of silly, especially on an open book test where you could easily pull it up and look at it. Uh, but that, that's pretty much what we're doing here. We're just showing how we want to acquire information. We want to refine the information over time. And we want to share it with the organization. Uh, so just kind of wrap things up. We talked about managing data. We talked about databases. We talked about big data. We talked about data warehouses and data marts, as well as knowledge management. Now, we're not done yet, but are there any questions so far? All right, so next I want to kind of go through a couple examples of doing an ERD from start to finish. So let me just go ahead and share uh, my Visio application. All right, does everyone see this okay? Yes. All right, appreciate it. All right, so... I said we're going to do two things. We're going to show the customers at a bank, and we're also going to show the um, employees and their jobs. So let's go ahead and uh, take a quick look at this. Uh, let me know if I need to make it bigger or smaller or anything like that. It's kind of hard for me to judge. So if we had a bank situation, uh, we're going to have a couple different things. Uh, first, we're going to have customers. Um, next, we're going to have accounts. And, you know, we're also going to have transactions that are going to involve those accounts. Um, are there anything else we want to include? Maybe like a branch location we could include. So we could have like a branch. Uh, maybe have like a branch number, which is just going to be some unique uh, sort of uh, identifier. Uh, we might have, want to have um, branch name. Um, address. Then we could add in another attribute down here for the branch itself. And we could have this be something like um, branch zip code. Okay. Um, now imagine we want to have like primary branch for the customer. So I've already got some customer information here. So just kind of go through this. We've got the customer entity. That's the thing that we want to look at. Uh, then we also have the customer ID. That's unique to each customer. So with inside of our bank, we issue some sort of unique identifier that is not going to change, and it's going to allow the customer to have some sort of unique ID. We want to get their first name. We want to get their last name. We want to get their address, their phone number, and uh, something else. So if this could be anything else we wanted. Um, let's go ahead and uh, use primary branch. So, you know, with primary branch, it's actually going to reference this branch number. So what I'm going to do, if I can, is I'm going to make this a foreign key. So on this particular uh, nomenclature here, we're actually going to use PK as the primary key 
and fk as the foreign key. That's how we're going to denote those two. So because primary branch is referencing this branch number, it's going to be a foreign key inside of the customer table. Now, uh, it's important to note primary or uh, foreign keys do not have to have the same name as the uh, primary key does. So this is called branch number. This is called primary branch, but it's the same number. Um, it's just not referred to in the same way. Does that make sense to everyone? Again, let me know if there's any questions. I'm certainly happy to address them. Um, but, you know, so customer has some primary branch. So let's go ahead and uh, put in a relationship. Uh, and this is not the easiest thing to do on the software, so I'll probably mess it up the first time, but that's okay. All right, that's good enough for now. Um, so basically, uh, we haven't actually done anything with these different symbols. Let's go ahead and see what we have. So we have customer has one and only one branch. Uh, and then branch has one to many customers. So this is for primary branch, by the way, um, because that's what we're actually looking at inside this table. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and make the begin symbol. Um, instead of being one to one, we want it to be one or more. Because a branch, if it doesn't have any customers at all, that's probably not going to stay open for very long. So customer has one and only one branch. So we want to set the symbol right here. Instead of being zero to more, one and only one. Uh, and again, you know, like I said, you read these. Branch has one to many customers. Customer has one and only one branch. Um, so just to kind of clarify that. Uh, but you know, again, it, we couldn't really end here. So we want to get a new entity out and we want to actually look at account. And you know, for account, we're going to have some sort of account number. And that's going to be the primary key. Uh, you'd also probably want to collect the starting balance. And we'll see why that's important in a, minute, in a little bit. But you know, if, to have information about how much is in the account, that's a very important thing. Uh, and then you'd probably also want to have like account type. Or you'd have like that be maybe checking, maybe you'd have it be some sort of loan, maybe you'd have it be a savings account. Uh, whatever account you'd have. Okay, so let's go ahead and make the relationship between customer and account. Well, it's not letting me connect it exactly like I want to, but um, I'll try it one more time. Oh, there we go. Okay, so customer has one account at minimum. I think that's pretty reasonable. But is there going to be a maximum number of accounts that a customer has? In most cases, not. Uh, whereas account is held by at least one customer, but they could also be held by multiple customers. So let's go ahead and do that. So it's going to be one to many for both of these. OK, now what's the problem with this right now? Someone tell me what the problem with that relationship is. So we have a many-to-many -many relationship there. Why is that a problem? Well, shouldn't it be from account to customer? That should be um, like the customer to the account should be a one-to-many because it's one particular customer. Or is that um, uh, to is that going against more of just the grand like more? broad um, kind of landscape between customer and account because there is many customers and many accounts but it should or, or should be one to one that'd be my guess so that's a, that's a great point Kyle is that um, you know these business rules this is not necessarily going to be the same for every different uh, bank uh, but you know in this case the way this kind of thinks about this is customer has access to one or more accounts in other words a customer could have only a checking account but that could also have a savings account. They could also have a credit card. Um, so they could have multiple accounts. And then each account is going to be held by at least one person, one customer. But it could be held by more customers. So there could be joint accounts. There could be uh, maybe some sort of a trust account where you know multiple people have access to that account. So that's kind of the train of thought here. 
But, you know, Kyle's exactly correct. This won't necessarily be true for everywhere. So, um, you know, it's going to be determined by business rules. So whatever the business specifies, that's what we're going to go with. Um, that's a great point. So uh, kind of going back, though, what's the problem with this many to many? So I'll go ahead and tell you all. The main problem is, is that you can't uniquely identify uh, which instance goes with which of these things. So to mitigate that, we're actually going to just remove this relationship and we're going to add an associative entity. And we'll call this like customer account or something. Does anyone remember what we do to kind of uh, have the primary key for an associative entity? So the first thing is going to come from the first um, entity that we're combining. And the second thing is going to come from the second entity we're combining. So I'm just going to move this line down one. And I'm going to go ahead and note this is a primary key. So now we're going to make a relationship between this table right here and somewhere like right there. And we're going to do the same for this table to this table. OK, so let's go ahead and think about this now. Customer has at least one of these account numbers. So but a customer account is going to be held by one and only one customer because now this is done to where it's unique to each customer. In other words, it's not only the account number, it's also the account number and the unique customer. So that allows this end relationship right here to be a one-to-one. -one. And this um, symbol right here is going to be one or more. And again, the reason this is going to be one or more from customer to customer account is because customers could have multiple accounts. Um, there could be more instances of the customer account for each customer, but they have to have at least one. If they don't have a minimum of one customer, you know, if, if they don't have a minimum of one account, they're not a customer. Uh, they're just kind of like a random person walking by. So let's go ahead and think about this. So we have customer account belongs to one and only one account. So we're going to make this end symbol right here. Um, we're going to make this be one and only one, but this symbol down here, uh, customer account, there could be more than one for a customer account. So it's going to be at least one, but it could be more than one because an account, again, could have multiple account holders. So let's say our account number is one. And, you know, with that, we would have a customer account would be her account number down here would be a one. And customer ID, we could have two customers associated with account one. So that's kind of where we're getting all this from. Let me go ahead and make these foreign keys because they are both foreign keys. Uh, any questions about that so far? I right, certainly let me know if there's any questions. I'm happy to address them or explain things a different way if I need to. Uh, but if not, I'm going to go ahead and move on. And we're going to do transaction. So there's a lot of different ways we could do the transaction table, and there's no right way. Um, let's go ahead and tell you that. Um, and and that's, that's the thing with any of these. They're... There could be wrong ways, but there's not going to be one right way. So that's another reason why I wouldn't uh, actually test you over making one of these entity relationship diagrams is because, you know, your way could be perfectly correct, but it could be marked incorrect. Of course, I wouldn't mark it incorrect, but you get what I'm saying. It, it just kind of gets difficult to kind of do. So we're going to make a transaction ID. We're going to make that the primary key. Uh, we're going to have transaction amount. We're going to have maybe account from. And we're going to add in one more little attribute down here for account to. And we probably also want to have some more information here. Uh, let me go ahead and add some more attributes in. Date. Time. Because we want to have the date and the time of the transaction. Because for balance, we're not actually going to put balance anywhere on this table. Um, Instead, what we would do for balance is we would have it be a calculated attribute where we would calculate it based on the starting balance and based on the transactions that have transpired within this account. 
uh, we're going to be able to calculate the balance. We don't need to store that information anywhere. We can simply calculate it anytime we need it. And that's going to be a superior way to do this. Um, so again, we have the transaction ID, we have the date, the time, the transaction amount, the account from. Now this is going to be a foreign key. Um, the account, if I can select it, this is also going to be a foreign key because these are both going to be referencing account number. So let's go ahead and add in a relationship between these two entities. Well, that's as good as it's going to get for now. I might be able to change it later. So account has one. It, well, it doesn't necessarily even have an initial transaction. So it could be a zero to many transaction, but a transaction is going to be involving, let's just say one and one account. So let's go ahead and do that. So a transaction is going to be involving one and only one account, but the transaction, the account could have zero to many transactions associated with it. So there's no maximum amount of transactions, nor is there a minimum amount of transactions. In other words, if you open up an account, there's not a requirement to have an account uh, transaction because the starting balance is included within the account entity. If we didn't have this starting balance there, uh, we would in fact see a, um, this would be a many-to-many -many relationship. We're going to keep things nice and simple and say that an account does not have to have a transaction. So, all right, any questions about this? Does this make sense? Is it confusing? It makes pretty good sense. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so I'm going to do a new one, and I'm actually going to have you guys give me some input. And, you know, this time we're going to do something you guys are probably pretty familiar with. Um, well, maybe not, but uh, hopefully so. We're going to do employees inside of their jobs. So I'm going to go ahead and lay out some different um, entities here, and I'm going to let you guys fill them in. So, you know, some things we'd want to do for a job, of course, we'd want to have maybe some information about the company, maybe some information about our employees, some information about the department, some information about the job. Um, that sort of thing, you know, pretty basic stuff. So uh, someone jump in here and tell me what I should call this first entity. In fact, let me, uh, let me go ahead and adjust the design of this a little bit, make sure it's uh, landscape. Um, Go ahead and fit all these on one page so it'll be a little clearer. And let me zoom in a little bit so we can actually see what we're doing. Uh, that's an important thing. Okay, looks like I got something in chat. Uh, employees, okay. That is a great answer. I have an employee table here. And what do you think the primary key would be for employees? Maybe their employee ID, maybe. I think that's a reasonable answer. So we're going to go ahead and call this ID. Any other attributes we should have for employees? Maybe name. Again, normally you'd do first name, last name as separate entities, or separate attributes, rather. We're going to keep things simple, though. Um, maybe address. Um, go ahead and add in a couple more attributes down here. Would like their position number? be one? Uh, so we're going to get to position in a little bit. Uh, phone number would be um, so on um, maybe some information about their position. And that's actually going to be a foreign key. So I'm going to go ahead and mark that as foreign key so I don't forget. Uh, because we're going to reference something else. So kind of what do you think we would reference if that's what we're going to do? So what should I call this entity down here? Anyone want to take a guess at this? So I could call it... um. Job, I could call it title. 
I could call it position. What do you guys think? Looks like I got someone in chat. Um, job, okay, call it jobs, no big deal. Um, so primary key, again, something unique to the job, I'm just gonna call it job ID. Um, maybe there'd be some sort of um, salary. Salary information and job. Um, now this is kind of gonna assume, we're gonna simplify things and assume that each job makes the same salary. It's pretty unrealistic, but we're gonna keep things nice and simple. Um, maybe job. And certainly, like I said, feel free to jump in with any questions, comments, anything like that. Um, Should you do hours? Um, you know, if it's hourly or um, you mean like if it's the job position is hourly or salaried? No, like if if they're supposed to come in, if it's an eight to five job or a um, nine to four or any what hours they would be working. Um, yeah, we could probably do that. That'd probably be an attribute for the employee. Um, hours of operation, let's just call it that. I'm um, just kind of see, you know, what each employee is going to work regarding that. That's a good point. Uh, so we have job, ID, salary, and job name. So the foreign ID is position, uh, the foreign key rather is uh, position. That's gonna be the same as this job ID. So in other words, we're not gonna have to replicate the salary on each and every employee. We're not gonna have to replicate the job name. We're only gonna replicate one single field and that's gonna to allow us to save a lot of disk space and to kind of make things easier. What if we change the salary of a position? You know, one of these jobs, what if we change that? Well, that's going to you know, certainly change things. So it's gonna reduce the amount of information we have to replicate. Okay, so let's come up here and let's think about the company itself. You know, what information do we need to have about ourselves if we're a company? What should the entity be called? Anyone want to take a stab at that? What should we call this entity about the company? Could I call it company? Okay. I think that's okay. Uh, so company, uh, we're just gonna call this company ID. Uh, I don't know why we'd have a primary key really for here if we're only using one company, but certainly if we have maybe multiple locations, that could certainly be the case here. In fact, I like location better. I'm gonna do location. ID. Uh, maybe something about uh, location name, um, location address. And again, you know, I'm making these all kind of, it wouldn't typically be done in this particular way. You'd probably have location address be like address line one, address line two, zip code, state. I have those all be separate attributes, but that takes a long time. We're going to simplify things. Um, just kind of make sure that we're doing things as easily as possible. So uh, next, we're going to put a relationship in between employee and location. So basically, we're going to say that an employee works at a location, and a location has some employees working at it. So this is going to be a business rule. It's just going to be kind of determined by the business. But you know, if a location has at least one employee working at it, I think that's pretty fair to say. Now, you're not going to have a location where no one works at it. Uh, what's the point of having a location if it's just no one there? Um, but an employee is only going to work at one location. So we're going to leave this one to one as is um, because an employee is not going to be working at multiple locations at once. Um, again, you know, this is the business rule. There could be cases in which employees would, but for this example, for what the, the business rules say, they're not. So location, we're going to change this from zero to many to one to many. So it's going to be one or more. Also call it one to many, whatever you want to call it there. Uh, that's what we're going to do. Now, there's one more thing I want to have on here, and that's going to be the information about the department. 
So what do you think that a primary key for the department should be? Anyone want to jump in here? I've got a lot of people with extra credit today, but... um. Maybe like the department, um, what department it is, something to specify which department. How about department in name? Is department name okay? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, certainly, you know, having uh, the department name is going to be unique. Uh, you're not going to have two departments called the same thing. Uh, whereas you could certainly have two employees called the same thing. Uh, if you have two departments called the same thing, I don't know why for departments. Um, there's probably not really a whole lot of other information we need to have for department. So now we're just going to put a relationship between. Um, it's going to put it between this employee and department. So um, I'm not sure I can get it to line up exactly. So we're just going to leave it as is uh, to where it doesn't actually touch. But in practice, it'd be touching the attribute. But see, I'm worried that if I snapped it up here, it'd snap and it'd make this confusing or it'd make this confusing. So that's why it looks like that. So employee is going to work in one and only one department, but a department is going to have uh, one to many employees. Uh, if you have a department without any employees, what does that mean? It means that it's not really a department. It's more like an idea. Uh, and this is a physical department. So we're just going to make that one to more. OK. Um, we could probably remove these two attributes down here. Um, any questions about this? So everyone kind of understands how to read these uh, you know, differences between attributes, um, between primary keys, foreign keys. Um, you know, everything. So uh, that's really all I have if there's no questions. I uh, hope you all have a great day today. I'll stick around in case anyone has any questions. Uh, I will probably upload these to Canvas just so you guys can have an example of them. I'll also upgrade or upload rather the, um, the various different uh, like one to many kind of what those look like. Just kind of put those in a PDF on Canvas as well. But. I'm certainly here to answer any questions that you all have.